All right, we'll just give everyone a few minutes or a minute to settle in. We'll go ahead and start. I want to welcome all of you to the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law at Stanford University. I'm Dee Dee Kuo. I'm the Associate Director for Research at CDDRL. And for the first time since March 2020, I am joining you from my actual office. This is actually CDDRL as opposed to my basement. So this is our final seminar of the academic year. Thank you all in the audience for joining us all of these past few months for the 30 speakers and panels that we've had this year. Next September, we're hopefully going to be doing a hybrid seminar where some of us are in person, but we still retain an option to watch the seminar online. So please look out for emails and announcements in early to mid-September about how the seminar will work. I also wanna thank CDDRL's events manager, Audrey McGowan, who you can't see, but has been here at every single seminar, who's leaving Stanford after 19 years at the university, 12 of which were spent at CDDRL. She has been absolutely fundamental to the CDDRL team. She's been an extraordinary colleague and she is the reason, literally the only reason we have been able to do the seminars this way all year. So I am profoundly grateful and congratulate her on her retirement. One of the best parts of working at CDDRL is the Fisher Family Honors Program in Democracy Development and the Rule of Law, which is a year long thesis program for juniors and seniors interested in a deep dive into topics related to our core areas of research. It's an interdisciplinary, highly selective program that was completely disrupted this year by the pandemic, as were all of our lives. So our thesis writers pulled off the tremendous feat of finishing their projects from their homes, scattered around the world with no access to all of the typical resources they would have on campus. Each year we give out two prizes to our thesis writers. The first is the Firestone Medal, which goes to the top 10% of theses written at Stanford. Our Firestone winner this year is Audrey Bloom, who is a, se a senior, well, she's going to be doing her senior year next year from Boston, Massachusetts, majoring in human biology, who wrote a thesis titled, How Doctors Influence the Price of Healthcare in the United States and Japan, The Critical Role of Interest Group Politics in America's Healthcare Cost Crisis. And her advisor was Terry Moe. She'll be speaking first. We also award a best thesis prize from CDDRL. And this year, the prize goes to Hiroto Saito, an international relations major from Chadsford, Pennsylvania, whose thesis is titled, Columbia After the FARC Has Peace Really Arrived? And his advisors were Gilly Vardy and Steve Stedman, and he will be going to Naval Candidate, Officer Candidate School in the fall. So the timing of this is that Audrey will speak first for 20 minutes, and then we'll have 10 minutes of Q&A after her presentation. At around noon, we will switch to Hiroto's presentation and wrap up with questions for him. Please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to ask questions during those two periods. And thank you all again for joining us. Now, Audrey, go ahead and share your screen. And um, we will make sure that everything is working on the tech side. Perfect. Okay. Go ahead and start. Give me one second. Oh, sorry. It's all set up. No, no, you're good. Okay. Can you see everything fine? Yes, you're Perfect. great. Great. Well, thank you everyone so much for being here today and for inviting me to share my research. I'm really honored to be speaking. My project was on how doctors influence the price of healthcare in the United States and Japan. And it's really a project about interest group politics and the role that they play in America's healthcare cost crisis. The United States spends $3.8 trillion on healthcare annually. This is a lot of money, both in absolute terms and in comparison to the rest of the world. Per capita spending on healthcare is well over twice and nearing three times the OECD average in the United States. New Zealand, the UK, Japan, Spain, they're all around this average of $4,000 per year, while the US is spending about $11,000 annually for the same things. For a long time, people thought that the spending was due to increased utilization of healthcare, so increased volume. But thanks to work done by political economist Uwe Reinhardt and others, for which the article was famously titled, It's the Price is Stupid. Scholars have known for almost 20 years 
that the United States and its peer countries actually consume about the same amount of healthcare. And it's the prices causing this huge difference, <clears throat> excuse me, in spending between the United States and other like countries. For all this spending, America has among the worst quality outcomes in the OECD, ranking about 25th out of 37, these 37 countries here. The problem here is that our spending on healthcare makes it unaffordable for most Americans, and it's hugely wasteful of precious funds we could be spending on any of a number of urgent priorities in this country. Knowing this, what are we spending that healthcare money on? 62% of the United States healthcare budget is spent on inpatient and outpatient care. So what is inpatient and outpatient care? It's the fees paid to hospitals for the use of their facilities. That's about 50% of inpatient and outpatient care. Fees paid to doctors for the services they render. That's about 35% of the budget. And then a few miscellaneous expenses making up around 15% of the budget. they are things like drugs administered by physicians in hospital or doctor's office settings. A lot of work has been done to understand and to scrutinize our spending on both hospitals and on things like prescription drugs. Doctors' fees have been far less studied and critiqued. So that's what I set out to do to investigate what's happening with this line item, doctors' fees. Why is it so significant and is that justified? There's one specific avenue that I wanted to focus on in this work. It's the idea that doctors' fees might be what they are because of a political reason, interest group influence. Interest groups are very prevalent in American politics and they have an important role to play in our democracy. There are ways they support the democratic process but there are also ways that they can undermine democracy. These groups can and often do accrue so much money and so much power that their activities end up hurting the American public at large while benefiting a narrow interest. This thesis investigates that concept of people who share a narrow interest organizing and heavily influencing policy that matters to them with the case of doctors interest groups being involved in federal policy that sets prices for doctor services. So this is the thesis of my thesis. It's that this really important driver of US health spending is the activities of interest groups representing doctors at the federal level when the government goes about determining prices for physician services. My approach for reaching this conclusion was to compare the United States with another country. The United States is very unique, both in its governance system and its healthcare. It can be really helpful in this case to have some sort of context to be able to understand what about our unique system uh, for pricing physician services is a product of political forces and maybe doesn't make so much policy sense. And the other reason it's great to study a situation of another country is that we can learn from the way they handle this task, right? Every country has to deal with this problem of how to provide care to people when they need it, what to involve in that system, who to involve in it, how to regulate it, and finally, how to finance it. For that reason, I chose to compare the process the United States uses to set prices for physician services with the process Japan uses to do the same thing. That may seem like a bit of a random choice, so I'm going to defend it a bit here, starting by saying that there's no perfect country with which to compare the United States because it is such an outlier. But Japan is a good comparator for a number of reasons. I chose Japan because on a whole series of dimensions, the United States and Japan align. And on the variables most crucial to this research, namely susceptibility to interest group influence and overall health system spending, they differ. The US and Japan align on things like size of their economy, characteristics of their health system, the presence of a politically powerful interest group representing doctors and more. And yet Japan spends less than half as much per capita as the United States on healthcare and their bureaucracy is more capable of rebuffing interest group advances. I set out to understand how the United States goes about determining prices for physician services and how Japan does the same. I'm gonna walk you through what I found for both these countries and then what I found to be consequentially different between the two countries' processes and viable ways I think we can use that information to improve our system in the United States. So starting with the United States, there are three key entities to understand. We're gonna start with the Medicare physician fee schedule. All prices, for medical services in the United States are tied to the Medicare physician fee schedule. It's a list of services and accompanying prices maintained by the US government, and it's been shaped from its inception by medical interest groups. 
This fee schedule is just for Medicare, which is a government program of health insurance for the elderly, but private payers base their payment rates off of this fee schedule. So it's the basis for the entire healthcare system. The American Medical Association or the AMA is a huge and highly active organization representing doctors in politics. It wields one of the largest lobbying budgets in Washington at $21 million per year. And they've been active in health policy debates since the early 1900s, fiercely protecting values like physician autonomy and like our current pricing scheme fee for service. The group has also made itself very relevant and important to the medical profession. Uh, they're involved in things like medical licensing and setting standards for medical schools and internships. Finally, the key arena for price setting activities for the physician fee schedule is a committee of doctors called the Relative Value Scale Update Committee, or RUC. And you'll hear me using this term RUC a lot throughout this presentation. The RUC is convened by the American Medical Association, and each year the RUC reviews prices from the previous year's fee schedule and makes recommendations for changes to those prices for the coming year. The RUC sends its recommendations to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, also known as CMS. CMS is an executive branch agency. It's part of the Department of Health and Human Services, and it's in charge of the government health insurance programs, Medicare and Medicaid, as the name might suggest. And this includes the Medicare physician fee schedule. CMS is responsible for publishing updates to the fee schedule every year. And historically, they've accepted 87.5% of the recommendations the RUC gives them unchanged. Now, the reason CMS accepts these recommendations so frequently is one of the mysteries this thesis tries to solve. And I'm gonna talk more about why I think it is later. But important to understand now, what this means is that the RUC, a committee of doctors, is by and large determining the prices for physician services in the United States. So what we might wanna know next is, how is the RUC going about making these determinations? The most important takeaway from the RUC's activities is that they are fraught with bias and imprecise science to arrive at their price change recommendations. The process for price setting starts when a type of doctor, let's say heart surgeons, decides that the fee for a heart surgery should change, usually get higher. So the relevant medical specialty society, in this case, the American College of Cardiology, would conduct a survey of its membership. They'd ask them questions like how much time and effort is involved in a heart surgery to try to arrive at a fair determination of a price. These surveys have really small sample sizes, usually around 30 to 100 respondents. And beyond being small, they're very non-random. There's this very specific type of uh, physician respondent. They're all cardiologists that stand to gain from saying their work is very, very difficult. They're all doctors who care enough about their profession and who feel uh, strongly enough about it to join a specialty society, right? Being a member of a specialty society is not a requirement of being uh, a physician. And they're also people who feel strongly enough about this specific issue to take the time out of their day to fill out this survey. So these sample respondents skew heavily towards uh, people who say their work is very hard and it's worth a lot of money. After the survey is conducted, the specialty society will prepare a proposal. For a price change recommendation, they'll bring it to the RUC. The RUC evaluates it and they vote on it. Unlike Congress, where a record of who voted for what is meticulously kept and followed by extra governmental organizations, voting at the RUC is secret. Nobody, including government bureaucrats, who are then going to receive these recommendations and have to decide you know, how to act on them, knows who voted for what, or even by how many votes a proposal won or lost. This is a really significant characteristic of the RUC's activities that allows it to operate without accountability for its decisions. I keep talking about this committee, so I think it's important to understand who actually is sitting on it. It's made up entirely of physicians, as I said. They're all physicians appointed and chosen by the American Medical Association. Now, the AMA is choosing people who have been active in their organization, which is an organization existing to advocate for physicians' interests and policy. The committee really benefits from portraying itself as an expert panel. And these physicians, no doubt, are experts at what they do. They're expert doctors. Uh, in this case, though, they're not acting as expert objective evaluators. Really, they're physicians acting in physicians' interest. 
So it's probably no surprise at this point that the vast majority of proposals brought to and approved by the RUC are for increases to fees. Even though many services have become easier to provide over time um, and less expensive with the development of new care delivery technologies, the RUC recommends that pretty much all prices continue to rise. Again, no surprise, overall healthcare spending increases because among other factors, prices for individual services increase and they increase beyond what an unbiased evaluation might determine that they should. So the situation in Japan, Japan has four important entities to understand. Like the United States, they also use a fee schedule for its health system. There's this for all goods and services in Japan, hence the term universal here. So it's much more straightforward than America's system, but it's the same idea. List of services, list of how much they're gonna pay for them. The most important decision-making entity for physician services prices in Japan is the Health Insurance Bureau. It's an executive branch agency that runs the fee schedule update. Like the American Medical Association in the United States, Japan has the Japan Medical Association or the JMA. They're very similar organizations. The JMA has strong connections in the diet, which is Japan's version of Congress, and it's heavily involved in the fee schedule update process. And finally, the committee, much like the ROC in the United States, is the Central Social Insurance Medical Care Council, often just called the Central Council because it's a bit of a mouthful. And this is a committee of both doctors and other providers and payers. It's convened by the Health Insurance Bureau to advise on price updates. The way it works in Japan is first, the prime minister and his team, based on both political considerations and national surveys of how much healthcare was used in the country that year, decide how much the healthcare budget will increase overall over the next two years. And the United States doesn't really do anything exactly like this, and it's a significant step in the Japanese process. After that step, individual goods and services get hashed out within the bureaucracy. So if the prime minister decides the whole health system is going to increase by 3%, then each individual service will by default increase by 3%. But what gets hashed out is that maybe one should really increase by 6%, and maybe one doesn't need to be increased at all. In fact, it's become easier to provide it will decrease by 2%. This all gets decided within the bureaucracy. Um, the agency in charge is the Health Insurance Bureau, circled here in red. Civil servants in this bureau do research to determine potential appropriate price changes, and they draft up a new fee schedule with input from the Ministry of Finance, who's advising on financial feasibility. Then the Health Insurance Bureau brings this draft to the Central Council, and the Central Council members offer feedback and they negotiate back and forth different edits to this draft. The Health Insurance Bureau and Central Council go back and forth in negotiations for over two months. It's a really lengthy and thorough process and government bureaucrats have the final say in price changes. Finally, the Bureau publishes the new fee schedule that it, the Ministry of Finance and the Central Council have reached consensus on. As I said before, back and forth negotiations and the use of rigorous data characterize the Central Council's activities. Um, one notable aspect that I'd say the first in my mind is its membership and how much more even handed it is than the United States RUC. It has doctors, nurses, dentists, insurers, and hospitals represented. The JMA chooses the doctor representatives, so their preferences hold significant weight in the council. But there are many other interests represented and the JMA is by no means dominant like the AMA is in the United States. And very strikingly, the Central Council has public interest members. They're usually academic health economists, um, also on the council along with all these stakeholders. And these people can offer really objective perspectives on sensible pricing. Furthermore, the activities of the Central Council are fully transparent and they're very well known in Japan. Journalists and curious citizens line up for hours before meetings to try to get a seat to come in and they listen to the Central Council's debates so this demands accountability on the part of the Central Council for the price changes they support and also the arguments they use to support them. This is another big difference between the way it works in the United States and in Japan. <clears throat> to make these important pricing decisions, government bureaucrats and the Central Council both reference national surveys of healthcare utilization and cost of providing care. These surveys are made much easier to carry out in Japan because of the country's universal health system uh, that the United States doesn't have. And I'd be happy to talk more about that in the Q&A. Uh, 
And finally, an indication that the Japanese process is really working in determining appropriate prices is that their fee schedule, some prices go up in their fee schedule, but most only by a little, some by a little more, and some actually go down to reflect advances in technology for care delivery. As a result, spending goes up by just a little bit each year at a rate that the country can afford. I've already touched on these important differences, but I'm just laying them out here quickly, all side by side. The first is America's lack of reliable survey data that allows for subjectivity to play a large role in price update decisions. This is compared to Japan's robust national databases they use for price change decisions. The second is this cover of darkness under which the American Medical Association's RUC operates, where voting behaviors are not reported and the whole process is little known. This is compared with Japan's full transparency and widespread public awareness. And third and most consequential and also the most difficult to fix is America's bureaucracy that struggles to have control over the fee schedule update process compared to Japan's capable bureaucracy that is empowered both structurally and culturally to be primary decision makers throughout the process. CMS and the entire United States bureaucracy suffers chronic time and resource constraints. This is much of the reason that CMS accepts almost 90% of the recommendations brought to them by the RUC. It's that they don't have the time or the resources to thoroughly vet the RUC's recommendations and to contest them with their own conclusions. It's important to understand that the structure and funding of the bureaucracy is the way it is because Congress legislated it as such. Legislators face an uphill battle overcoming political sway of all the interest groups that benefit from the system as it is, of which the American Medical Association is only one. The United States has an institutional structure that enables private interests to wield their political power with really great success. And these interest groups are contributors to political, to excuse me, politicians' campaigns. They're an important determinant in their election, their re-election prospects. So the bureaucracy isn't able to do so much to change the system or their abilities within it. We have to do that through policy. And there are a few things that can be done within the context of our special interest-driven political situation. They address the issues of transparency, data, and bureaucracy that I've discussed before. First, Congress and the administration should demand greater transparency from the RUC. A set of guidelines to start with would be the Federal Advisory Commission Act, which is the standards of transparency that all federal advisory boards are subject to. They include things like open meetings, thorough reporting and involvement of the public. The RUC is currently exempt because it's a private committee, right? It's convened by the American Medical Association. It's not convened by the government. I'll talk more on this in just a moment, but to address data, the government should fund administrative agencies to carry out large scale surveys and data collection. And they should partner with respected survey organizations to do this work. Without this investment, government agencies will continue to be reliant on interest groups like the AMA for such information. The good news is that a lot of these national surveys already exist. Decision makers should use these sources instead of relying on small end surveys with non-random respondents conducted by specialty medical societies. Finally, to address disempowered bureaucracy, there are two policy options. First, in order to allow the bureaucracy to better monitor and take part in RUC deliberations, the RUC could be reconstituted as a federal advisory commission. Basically, they'd become an advisory committee like what the Central Council is to the Health Insurance Bureau in Japan. Unfortunately, this is the least likely of my policy recommendations. And so the other option is to further empower MedPAC, which is this legislative branch advisory body that already exists. They generate reports and develop recommendations to Congress on all things Medicare. And this includes how to improve the fee schedule update process. It's currently a really underutilized resource and it can be an effective watchdog to the RUC, but only if it's given adequate resources to do its work. The American Medical Association and, and its allies in Congress will resist the reforms I'm recommending and any others mightily. However, America is increasing its investment in healthcare and social progressives continue to affirm with louder and louder calls that healthcare is a right, not a privilege. With increasing evidence of poor quality and high costs, the value of our nation's health system is becoming an issue of keen interest to more people in more groups. As the fiscal and social urgency around this issue grows, support for enacting policy change grows with it. 
It will be a struggle, but it is possible for the United States to bring its healthcare spending under control while also providing reliable and quality care to its citizens. This is and will continue to be the challenge of politicians, bureaucrats, doctors, healthcare executives, activists, voters, and every recipient of healthcare in the United States. Thank you all so much for listening and I look forward to your feedback. Thank you, Audrey, for that great presentation and for this really wonderful research. Um, clear off my desk a little bit. We, so the first question I have is you asked, you sort of signaled that you'd be interested in talking about the uh, universal healthcare system that Japan and most other OECD countries have compared to the United States. Could you say a little bit more about what role you think that plays in reducing or affecting healthcare costs? Of course. So one thing that's been heavily studied already um, is that universal healthcare decreases, um, let's call it inefficiencies or just like extra tasks and noise in the healthcare system that the United States has to pay a lot to handle. Um, this is the, the line item is called administrative costs and the United States is known for having very high administrative costs and Japan, even though they have a lot of people working on this has very low administrative costs in relative terms. That's a more obvious answer. The thing that I learned from my research that I think is really interesting is how the universal healthcare system has allowed Japan and I would assume other countries with this system to um, collect almost automatically very robust and thorough widespread data on healthcare utilization uh, because they are an actor in paying for healthcare. The government requires documentation of what services are rendered by whom, when, to whom, and they collect this information and it gives them complete data on sort of what's going on in the healthcare system. Seems pretty basic, but it's something that the United States really struggles to do because our healthcare system is so fragmented and so privatized. So I think okay. that that's something that can really be gained from a universal healthcare system is this really important data that we should be relying on to make our decisions. Okay, so you mentioned privatized healthcare. There's a question in the Q&A about why market forces don't limit or reduce the cost of medical services. Did you come across anything about how that operates? It's a big question. I think my most basic answer to it would be that uh, the, mar the idea of market forces really relies on complete information for the consumer. And what makes healthcare so different and medical care so different from just your average you know, consumer looking at products to buy in a store, let's say, is that they're relying on doctors who are the price givers, the price determiners, to tell them what services they need and to tell them who they need to give, like who should be rendering them. So they really don't have this uh, advantage of complete information that would allow them to quote unquote shop and create competition between providers. Um, so one of the arguments for higher costs in the United States is that the quality of service is so high. Uh, did you find that, um, you know, the quality of healthcare services in the United States exceeds that of countries with universal health care or with lower health care costs? Or is there any relationship or trade-off in actuality? Yes, there definitely is. And like many things in the United States, it's very much a question of whether you care about the average or whether you care about sort of the tippity top of what a country is able to do. So as I said in my presentation, our average quality of healthcare is very low. It's 25th out of the 37 OECD countries. What the United States is able to do is if you have a lot of money, if you have a lot of access, you have a lot of time and all the other things that allow you to put a lot of resources into care, then the best of the best is in the United States. Um, this is an argument that's used, um, especially in pharmaceuticals and biotechnology development. We pay a lot, so we get sort of the tip of innovation and the cutting edge is in the United States. And it's a really difficult trade-off. I think that we can do a lot better to bring our average way, way higher while continuing to maintain this like amazing ecosystem for innovation that high prices is able to create. 
Okay, so one one or two final questions. Uh, one question is why doesn't Medicare or does Medicare have complete information about medical procedures and payments, um, given that it operates somewhat more universally or you know more like state uh, state over has more state oversight than just the private medical system? Yes, so they have information. They still struggle because though Medicare is paid for by the government, it's still privatized. So Medicare pays, the government through Medicare pays Blue Cross Blue Shield or whoever it is to provide care. And then the patient pays, pays Blue Cross Blue Shield and they pay or they um, send the bill to the government. Sorry, that was difficult for me to get out. Um, so there's still a lot of middlemanning that makes the data collection a little more difficult. In theory, yes, they get this information. The difficult part is that Medicare represents, I want to say 20%, maybe slightly less, like 18 or 19% of the healthcare system. And it's a pretty, again, non-random group of people. It's people over 60, maybe 65. And um, they are not everyone. So though we have information on this population, it's not really giving us the full story, which is what we need to know. Okay. So um, the final question has to do with you personally. And uh, while, before I ask it, Hiroto, why don't you go ahead and share your screen and you can pop back into the webinar so we can get you settled in to presentation mode. Um, mm -hmm. So Audrey, how has this research, you know, what, briefly, what inspired it and how has doing this research affected your, um, either sort of your views on these issues or alternatively your, your career trajectory? Yeah, great question, great question. Um, the inspiration for this research was that I've always been someone who's been interested in many topics, the biggest ones being health and healthcare um, policy, like especially social policy and especially international comparisons of social policy to inform United States choices. And so I came to, I always knew I wanted to do a thesis in CDDRL. And when I what set, set about like coming up with a topic, I need, I was looking for a topic that could bring together these somewhat disparate interests into something that like was the overlapping, like center point of all of them. And this is what I came up with, with the help of many amazing advisors and professors that I spoke to at Stanford over the course of maybe like six months. Um, and to the second question about it's, I guess we'll say like how it's inspired what I wanna do in the future. I think I was really surprised by the um, reaction to my, I sent out my thesis to a few people and I was really surprised by the reaction I got back um, of people saying, we could actually do something around this. Like you should publish this. Someone should like, these are things that actually we can do. And actually I have the ability to contribute to the conversation productively. And I want to do that. I think I've always been interested in policy and long-term working in policy, either within government or without. Um, and I'm getting more and more interested in working in one of these like internal to bureaucracy roles, but these kind of special committees like MedPAC because they exist, but they're, and they're sort of, they have a special mandate. Um, and I think that there's a lot of potential for their impact on our, on our policy that, you know, decides so much of everyone's um, well-being and their lifestyle. So we'll see. That's fantastic. <laughs> there's so many things that are wonderful that you could do and will do. Um, so thank you so much, Audrey, for that presentation. And we will now move to Hiroto. Um, go ahead and start. So uh, is the presentation coming through fine? Yes, it looks great. OK, great. So uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Um, it's an honor to be able to present on behalf of uh, CDDRL. And I present to you all my thesis, which is titled Columbia After the FARC, Has Peace Really Arrived? So just to get started, I'd like to give a Sparknotes version of the historical context of my thesis. So Colombia has been engulfed in an asymmetric civil war for more than half a century. The Colombian government has fought against the myriad of non-state armed groups, and I'm going to refer to them as NSAGs from now on. Um, and 
uh, the most famous and arguably most powerful of these armed groups was the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, uh, abbreviated the FARC. And it's a Marxist-Leninist guerrilla group that sought to overthrow the uh, sitting government. But the internal armed conflict in Colombia has involved other actors as well. Um, there have been paramilitary groups, such as the United Self-Defense Forces of Colombia, uh, or the AUC, which were originally formed to combat the guerrillas. And Another dimension of the conflict has been the involvement of powerful organized crime groups, uh, the most famous of them perhaps being the Medellin cartel, which we might all know from the show Narcos. Um, all three of these groups are technically now defunct, but their successors and other groups that fall into one of these three categories of NSAGs are continuing the fight against the Colombian government to this day. And in 2016, the Colombian government and the FARC negotiated a landmark peace agreement that meant the demobilization and political reintegration of the FARC. There was a lot of hope that this would significantly reduce violence in Colombia because the FARC was the most powerful of these NSAGs and its extinction would supposedly allow government security forces to finish off the other NSAGs. And, and yeah, and the background here shows the handshake between the Colombian president, uh, Juan Manuel Santos, and the FARC uh, leader, Timochenko. So unfortunately, things haven't gone so great since the peace deal came into effect. In Colombia overall, homicide rates and other measures of violence have actually stayed pretty level, about the same. And in the former FARC municipalities, and by that, uh, I mean municipalities that had a FARC presence at the time the 2016 peace deal was signed, um, in these municipalities, there have been reports of sustained or even increased violence. And there have been hundreds of instances, for example, of demobilized FARC members or community leaders uh, being assassinated. Um, so, so that's a little bit strange, right? Like, why wouldn't a peace agreement bring more peace? Isn't that the point of a peace agreement? So uh, I found a, a puzzle here, a multidimensional problem uh, here, where academically, like, why did some municipalities experience more or less violence after the peace deal? Um, and like, how could peace processes, processes have been how could the peace process have been improved to avoid uh, these uh, undesirable outcomes? So here you can see a graph of the number of homicides in the former FARC municipalities from 2013 to 2020. And you can see that there are more homicides after the peace deal in the four years after the peace deal than before. The decrease from 2013 to 2016 uh, that you can see here uh, can be attributed to the FARC starting to decrease their uh, militant activity as negotiations began in 2013. But then you see this notable, noticeable rise here in the latter four years. And I'm just gonna present some differing headlines to, to highlight, I guess, the differences in uh, municipal outcomes. So um, these headlines from local Colombian newspapers show uh, this variation. And the headline to the left says, in English, how the communities um, and professors are constructing peace in the south of Tolima department. And the headline to the right says, an armed incursion and new massacre in Tarasa, which is a municipality in Colombia, uh, is, is denounced. So on the left, it seems like things are going pretty well. And on the, in the right headline, things uh, seem to be getting worse. So now we come to the research question. Um, I asked, why have some former FARC municipalities seen an increase in violence since the 2016 peace deal came into effect? And what has contributed to intermunicipal variations in these violence outcomes? So to situate my research within the existing literature, I conducted a pretty broad literature review. Um, the complexity of the Colombian conflict required me to look at a number of different themes, um, especially since the post-2016 peace deal uh, era has elements of ongoing civil war and post-civil war. I can go and highlight just the most essential literature right now. So uh, the literature on violence during civil war gave me an idea of the control collaboration model by uh, Stathis Kalibas. Put simply, he theorized that civil war violence is greatest in areas where one belligerent faction has hegemonic but incomplete control. This has to do with the fact that those conditions encourage civilians to denounce enemies or perceived enemies to the hegemonic group. Violence is lowest in areas where one group has total control, which I'd say is pretty intuitive. Um, but also interestingly, in it's lowest in evenly contested areas. And Calivas attribute, attributes this to the fact that in evenly contested areas, there's a lot of risk in denouncing people to one group because the other group is equally capable of uh, retaliating against you. 
Um, but this is all complicated. What's essential to know uh, for now is that violence is worse in contested areas where one group has uh, the upper hand. So these humps here. Um, so zones one and five uh, represent like areas of total control by one or the other group. And then zone three represents, uh, I guess, like evenly uh, contested areas. And I also drew from other themes in the literature. Uh, literature on violence after civil war told me that it's actually not an uncommon phenomenon to see increased violence after civil war. It's just like a popular misconception. So yeah, for example, a, a notable example is the Salvadoran civil war. Homicides and violent crime surged in the aftermath of the peace accords there. Um, and there are a lot of reasons why, why uh, violence might go up, but some of the most relevant ones uh, is the lack of public security and order, the development of organized crime groups, and demobilized combatants returning to the fight. And the literature on spoilers um, and the literature on the end of civil wars also told me that peace processes can be complicated by the presence of outside parties that want the process to fail, which in Colombia's case might be the other NSAGs that weren't party to the peace negotiations. And the literature also told me that peace processes can fail due to insufficient security guarantees, which I'll get to later, but it definitely applies in Colombia uh, with regard to this epidemic of assassinations of former FARC members and how that has encouraged some of them to, to return to the war. And the literature on natural resources was important as well. It told me that resource presence can extend civil wars. And it was hypothesized that in Colombia, resources support uh, NSAG activity, but this causal pathway linking um, the availability of illicit resources and NSAGs wasn't definitively like identified. So in a, I saw an opportunity here to pr prove or disprove this causal pathway through my research. So after reviewing the literature, I was able to make some informed hypotheses. The first is that following the peace deal, the former FARC municipalities experienced poor outcomes in terms of homicide rates compared to non-former FARC municipalities. And for my second hypothesis, I first created this typology of former FARC municipalities. And it might look complicated, but basically it, it looks at what NSAGs are present during the four years before the peace deal, so 2013 to 2016 and the four years afterwards, 20, 2017 to 2020. So for example, type one municipalities, this first row here, saw a FARC presence, but only a FARC presence during the four years before the peace deal. Um, and then after the peace deal, we saw no uh, NSAG presence at all. And then I consolidated uh, these eight types of municipalities into four categories of municipalities based on NSAG presence, and then ranked them on how I predict predicted violence changed from before to after the 2016 peace deal. In general, I predicted that violence increased for all of these municipalities based off of the existing literature on violence after civil war, but I ex expected differences based on NSAG presence during the period after the peace deal. So vacated municipalities uh, here to the left, um, were municipalities that saw no FARC or NSAG presence um, after the peace deal. Residual FARC municipalities saw the incomplete demobilization of the FARC, which means there were dissident uh, or residual FARC members active, but saw no other NSAG presence. Transferred municipalities saw the presence of one or more non-FARC NSAGs, so the FARC was supplanted by some other group in these municipalities. And then finally, contested municipalities, uh, which I predict saw the greatest increase, saw the incomplete demobilization of the FARC and the presence of at least one other non-FARC NSAC. So it, was, so it was just contested between multiple groups. Um, and I expected that these contested municipalities uh, saw the greatest increase in violence because according to Kaliva's control collaboration model, areas where there's a stronger group, which would be the non-FARC NSACs and a weaker group, the FARC dissidents uh, being weakened because of the, this like loss of national structure after the vast demobilization that happened in 2016. In these municipalities, Calivas's model would uh, expect or predict the most violence. And my third hypothesis was that coca cultivation density was associated with increases in homicide rates after the peace deal, so a little bit more straightforward. And my fourth hypothesis was uh, on similar lines, illegal mining density, which is another uh, common illicit economy in Colombia was associated with increases in homicide rates after the peace deal. And finally, I had a fifth hypothesis, which said that military presence was associated with decreases in homicide rates after the peace deal. So my dependent variable was 
the change in violence levels from before to after the 2016 peace deal, but I had to figure out how to measure that. So after consulting the literature, I settled on homicide rates as a proxy for violence uh, in my quantitative analysis. And I got all this data from the Columbia National Police. So basically in this thesis, I performed a large end statistical analysis. And then I followed up with case studies to essentially cover my bases uh, and test my results. Um, since I couldn't be really sure that my quantitative results were anchored in the reality on the ground. For the quantitative part um, of my thesis, I did a statistical analysis of all 1,122 municipalities in Colombia. I used three competing um, ordinary least squares regression uh, methods for rigor. And I coded for 12 independent variables in total with three of them being controls or things like poverty level or urbanization. And I looked at the four years before and after the peace deal, which meant 2013 to 2020. And I did a lot of hand collecting information through databases and maps. So uh, I got a lot of practice with Spanish, uh, which, is, which I guess was good for me, I guess. And this is just an idea of how my data, data collection looked. So this is just an Excel where it went down 1,122 rows and I coded for all these uh, different variables. And this map uh, is kind of representative of the other, like the, all the different kind of maps that I had to look at to code for, say, uh, NSAG presence. So this map shows the presence of the FARC just prior to the 2016 peace deal. All these municipalities that are in orange uh, uh, reported this FARC presence right before the peace deal. So in terms of my findings from my quantitative analysis, uh, I found that former FARC municipalities experienced statistically significant uh, greater homicide rates than non-former FARC municipalities. So what I saw, um, in, I, I was able to confirm what I saw in anecdotal reporting. Um, I also found that NSAG presence is highly correlated with cocoa cultivation. Uh, you can see that in the cross tabulation table to the right here, which compares contested municipalities uh, with the level of cocoa cultivation density. It shows that as cocoa cultivation density increased from zero to three, as measured by my data sources, the likelihood of the former FARC municipality being contested increases significantly. So for example, of the 25 municipalities with this highest level cocoa cultivation, more than half were contested municipalities. I also found that contested municipalities experienced by far the greatest increase in homicide rates, while the other municip municipality um, categories increases were statistically indistinguishable from zero. This tells us that the increase in violence that was reported in the media was really driven by these contested municipalities. I also found that coca cultivation and illegal mining only have a significant effect on homicides when I don't control for inside presence. The effect basically dis disappears when I control for inside presence. This reveals a causal pathway where the effect of cocoa cultivation and illegal mining is really mediated by inside presence. And there was strong, strong evidence that these criminal economies attract insects, which violently fight, violently fight over control of these resources. And it wasn't that cocoa cultivation increased violences, violence in other ways, for example, like uh, increasing unorganized criminal violence. I also found that military presence does not have any significant effect on violence, but I might attribute this to the difficulty of measuring uh, military active activity. Um, my methods were, were pretty rough for that variable. So I had the quantitative results, which is great, but sometimes large end studies can obscure more complicated dynamics. So I decided to do a more in-depth qualitative analysis through case studies to test my quantitative findings. Uh, I selected two cases using the diverse case study method, uh, which in layman's terms uh, means that I chose the two municipalities that saw the greatest change in homicide rates in opposite directions, so the greatest increase and greatest decrease. I selected Tarasa in Antioquia department, which saw its homicide rates rate skyrocket from an average of 100.13 homicides per 100,000, uh, during the four years prior uh, before the peace deal to 276.29 homicides in the four years uh, afterwards. And, and that's, a, that's a huge increase. 
For the greatest decrease, I selected Ataco in Tolima department, which saw its homicide rate decrease from an average of 45.27 homicides per 100,000 to a pretty respectable 19.40 homicides per 100,000, which is lower than a lot of, say, U.S. cities. Um, and they made a good comparison because they're both rural and medium-sized and out-of-the-way uh, municipalities. So there was some base level of similarity there. What I found from my case study of Tarasa was that it was a conflict hotspot for decades, serving as a hub for coca cultivation, illegal mining, and drugs and weapons trafficking. It saw the presence of multiple insects at once that often uh, violently clashed with each other. The situation prior to the 2016 peace deal was pretty dire. After the peace deal, though, uh, and after the peace deal, the FARC forces in the municipality failed to completely demobilize and were actually largely left intact but they were weakened in their capacity to actually commit violence and other NSAGs were reported as attempting to expand into former FARC territories in the municipality leading to uh, clashes. And it set the stage for this uh, situation where you would have an imbalance of power between belligerent, belligerent factions. And control over coca plantations and illegal mines was reported as key for these territorial expansions. And the central government failed to establish control in the municipality after the FARC left. So basically the peace deal served to destabilize this like delicate, so to speak, balance of power between NSAGs and Tarasa, leading to uh, greater violence. And what I found from my case study of Ataco was that it was like Tarasa, a conflict hotspot for decades. It was a FARC st stronghold and was a strategic corridor for trafficking of illicit goods. But the key difference was that there was no coca cultivation or illegal mining activity to speak of. And violence in the municipality significantly jumped in the late 1990s and early 2000s as paramilitaries tried to displace the FARC. So the situation pre-peace deal was relatively similar to that um, in Teresa. There were multiple groups active in the municipality at once. But after the peace deal, there was only a weak and sag presence in the municipality. And the FARC in the area mostly demobilized and there was no incursion of NSAGs into former FARC territories as we saw in Teresa. And there's also a much better influx of government resources into the municipality as a result. So in summary, the case studies reinforced the evidence that criminal economies, uh, so coca cultivation, illegal mining, encouraged territorial competition between NSAGs in the power vacuum left by the demobilization of the FARC. And the key here is that it didn't matter so much that the FARC was replaced by some other NSAG in the wake of the peace deal, or even that the government failed to move in and uh, fill this power vacuum. What did matter was the availability of illicit resources and the presence of non-FARC NSAGs that sought to take advantage of whatever weakened FARC residual groups or dissidents that were in the area um, to take control uh, of the resources. And just to wrap up, some opportunities for future research uh, could include considering more independent variables like the presence of demobilized combatants in addition to active combatants. Uh, I could also consider control over presence. Uh, NSAC presence doesn't really give a good measure of just how much control it had over the municipality or how much control NSAC had over a municipality. But this will be difficult to measure without field work. And uh, as we all know, we had a pandemic, which kind of prevent, prevented all of that. And I could also look at time variant uh, variables and do a panel regression where I look at year, year by year changes in homicide rates instead of just four year averages in a before and after format like I did. And finally, um, in this thesis, I only really look at Columbia. So it'd be interesting to test the external ability of my findings when possible. Although the example of Columbia is pretty unique in that regard. And in terms of policy, my thesis really highlights the difficulties and dangers of bilateral peace agreements in a multilateral conflict. The NSAC's not party to the agreement have really caused a lot of trouble in post-FARC Colombia because in many cases, they really benefited from the FARC being gone. So a divide and conquer approach to peace might not be the best way, best way for the Colombian government to go about things. My findings also show how the peace, quote unquote peace, can sometimes be worse than the war. So one can't take for granted that coming to a peace agreement will just magically make things better. And lastly, 
Um, my results question the priorities of the Colombian government and its response to the conflict. The government has dedicated a lot of resources to coca eradication, but it might be better to reallocate these resources to combating the uh, insects directly, and even better addressing the stru structural causes of the conflict, which falls under themes like rampant inequality. Coke eradication might hurt the finances of the NSAGs, but it doesn't really address the root causes of the conflict. And we have to remember that the conflict started before cocoa cultivation became a major, major criminal economy in the first place. So getting rid of this uh, revenue source doesn't guarantee that these, far, these NSAGs go away at all. Okay. And that would be my presentation. And I'd just like to thank my advisors and, and the uh, CDDR staff and cohort uh, for all of their support. Great, thank you so much, Hiroto. Sorry to, didn't mean to cut you off at the end there, but I wanted to um, thank you for this research and ask, uh, so you, you end with some policy recommendations for the construction of peace deals. Is there anything that you think foreign governments like the United States could do to help build peace in, in conflict-ridden countries and societies as well? Yeah, so the U.S. government has invested a lot of money into Colombia over the past 20 some years uh, to try to bring about peace. But the real focus of this funding has been in, like, say, kinetic, uh, like military solutions um, or coca eradication has, a, has been a big aspect. But we haven't really focused on, say, providing like general aid to, to get rid of the structural inequality that gave rise to this uh, ideological conflict in the first place. So I think there is a, a place for foreign governments like the US to really help out the Colombian government, but I would question the, the uh, usefulness at this point uh, of continuing to just solely fund like military uh, uh, solutions uh, to, to, to the conflict. Like 20 years ago, for example, the FARC controlled about a third of Colombia. Things were really bad. So I would understand, you know, wanting to support the Colombian army in that mm -hmm. regard. But now it's a little bit of a different situation. You're not going to be able to completely get rid of these uh, non-state armed groups just by like trying to crush them uh, through military force. So. Right. so you started with some scholarly literature on how natural resources uh, can produce conflict um, and in any number of ways. They can disrupt politics, they're associated with authoritarianism, et cetera. So what do you think your study contributes to our scholarly understanding of the relationship between natural resource extraction and other kinds of outcomes related to either democracy or development? Um, I would just say that my thesis, I think really uh, reinforced this causal pathway I talked about that linked the uh, likelihood of NSAGs and thus violence coming to a specific area is related to these, um, the availability of natural res na these illicit natural resources. And that wasn't really laid out clearly in the literature before in previous studies of Colombia. And uh, I was able to root it in uh, what's happening in the last seven, last eight years, right? So I think my thesis really just like adds to the a lot of the existing literature on, on just how uh, natural resources, um, illicit natural resources make things really difficult. Like for example, we saw that and uh, we've seen that in Afghanistan as well uh, with the availability of, of opium. Um, so yeah, I guess that'd be my answer. Okay, so this a similar question to what I asked Audrey, which is, you know, what was some of your inspiration for this thesis and how did your thinking about it evolve over time? And how has this research now shaped what you're going to do in the future. Right, so um, I've just been interested in, in Latin America in general for a few years now. And I actually, uh, last year, I had the opportunity to work for uh, US Southern Command uh, as a civilian uh, to do some work in the region. And I got some good exposure to that. And then uh, in the past year, I also worked for Insight Crime, which is one of the leading uh, foundations uh, slash journalistic organizations that reports on organized crime in, uh, in Latin America. So that really reinforced it. Uh, my thesis has definitely evolved since the very beginning of it. Um, I was not, I did not intend on doing a quantitative analysis at all. I am a more history type person. So I had to learn a lot of quantitative uh, methods 
but uh, it just turned out that that was the best way for me to approach this really this really interesting question that I found. So, um, so yeah, that's it. You did a tremendous job. Um, you definitely learned a lot in a year really fast by yourself, and it was a really wonderful thesis um, that came together so well. So thank you. thank you so much to these two students, Audrey Bloom, Hiroto Saito. We are, we are so happy to have you as part of the CDDRL community this past year, despite the conditions um, of not actually being able to be together. And we are so excited for everything that you're going to do in the future. You're getting a lot of kudos in the Q&A, people just saying bravo and excellent presentation. So. Thank you so much. I get to meet them in person tomorrow for the first time. So I'm very excited. And thank you to all of our audience for being here and for seeing these students and what they've accomplished. Thank you both.